Walshart's Valve Gear. You've heard me say those words in that order a lot on this channel over the years. And maybe some of you are still like, okay, that's great. What the heck is a Walshart? What, what is that? What even is that? In fact, what's a Valve Gear? I don't know. Confusing. You use these words. These words, darkness, explain it. Okay, all right, relax, relax. This is probably taking too long for me to go into detail about. But Walshart's Valve Gear is a Valve Gear. And it is the most popular type of Valve Gear utilized by both the United States and Britain in the 20th century. And in terms of what a valve gear even is, well, it's a critical component of steam locomotive operation generally. It's a mechanism that operates the inlet and exhaust valves to admit steam into the cylinder and allow exhaust steam to then escape at the correct points in the steam cycle. If you're an auto mechanic, it's similar to how the pistons work in an engine. But obviously there are some key differences because instead of a controlled tiny explosion in the pistons, this is the expansion of steam. And there are many different ways to do it, but Walshart's version is generally considered the best, or at least the most popular. There were some other developments that offer different perks and advantages over Walshart's, but by far, Walshart's was the one that was most used because it was the most reliable and consistent. It did what it did, and did it well and no one had to question it because they knew it would work. The inventor of the valve gear was one E-Guide Wolschartz, who was a Belgian mechanical engineer. Born in Mechelen, Belgium in 1820, he was a smart guy from the get-go. He first rose to fame as a modeler, and when he presented his work at a local exhibition, Minister Rogier, who had opened said exhibition, was so impressed with him that he arranged for Wolschartz to attend the Leeds University. By 1842, Walsharts would join the Belgian state railways and reach the rank of foreman two years later. He would be made chief superintendent of the works shortly after that, but didn't go beyond there. He stayed as the chief superintendent for the rest of his career. It's unclear why he was never promoted beyond that point, but regardless, in 1844, he developed a new type of valve gear that would become known as the Walshart's valve gear. Named after him, obviously. His design was interesting and pretty advanced. It allowed for reversing, for one, and it allowed for two different settings. One for power and one for economy. But he was too low ranking within the Belgian state railways to patent his device himself. Which sounds like an insane rule, by the way. What the heck is that? But fortunately for Walshartz, he was good friends with a fellow engineer and colleague, one M. Fisher. Fisher was a higher rank than Walshartz, and was able to apply for the patent on his friend's behalf, and did right by him. He never claimed any contribution to it himself, and the only mistake that was made was that Walshartz's name was misspelled, omitting the last S, resulting in the patent saying Walshart, valve gear instead of Walshartz. But M. Fisher was definitely a bro for doing that for his friend. And the valve gear was easily Walshart's greatest creation, and the one he's most known for. He would make a pretty successful version of a coreless stationary engine in 1874, but he would pass away at the age of 81 in 1901, just before almost every single steam locomotive in both the UK and America used his design. Listen, maybe you're a gambler. Maybe you like playing guessing games. And maybe the game is, what kind of valve gear did this steam engine have? Listen, if it was an American or British one made after 1900, if you guess Walshart's, there's like a 75% chance of you being right. A lot of engines used it. And that was because the Stevenson valve gear that was used prior wasn't so great for larger locomotives. And the Stevenson also required that part of the mechanism be underneath the locomotive, in between the wheels. Walshart's valve gear didn't have to be an inside cylinder at all. No part of it needed to be. It could be entirely on the outside, and that made maintenance a lot easier. On top of that, because of its ability to be expanded upon and used for larger designs, it made it much more flexible. You could put it on almost any kind of steam engine, and it would work even into some more gigantic ones like the Simple Articulates. Some of the earliest engines to utilize the Walshart's valve gear would have been double fairlies, believe it or not. 
supplied to the New Zealand Railways, known as the NCRB class. These engines were built in Britain by the Avonside Engine Company, and were definitely the first use of the Welsharts valve gear in New Zealand, and is generally believed to be the first time that a British manufacturer supplied the design, though that's still somewhat debated on. The first use of the valve gear was actually on a Mason bogey over here in America, but it didn't take much longer for everyone to figure out, wow, these valve gears are actually awesome, we should use them on absolutely everything! Well, there were other options. In the UK, there was the Gresley gear, for example. And over here in America, there was the Baker valve gear. The Walsharts was easily the most dominant. The Baker, for one thing, was basically just a modified Walsharts. It wasn't even really its own thing. And the problem with the Gresley gear was that it required much higher maintenance costs. You had to baby those things, even though they were technically superior in other categories. Europe used the Walsharts valve gear as well, though you may not call it that over there. You may call it the Hussinger valve gear, named after Edmund Hussinger von Waldeck. Hussinger was a German mechanical engineer and did develop that valve gear in 1849, after Walsharts and his version was independent. They didn't know about each other. Interestingly, Hussinger's version was actually closer to the final version of the valve gear that most engines in the 20th century would have used, but Walsharts was so close, and clearly the same thing, that he's still credited with the design. And it's not like either one ripped each other off, it was literally an independent thought. Both were brilliant, and both came up with a really good idea. Either way, the point is that the valve gear saw widespread use in many places. And as I mentioned earlier, it has two main settings. One for economy, and one for UNSPEAKABLE POWER! Regardless of which setting is being utilized, the way it works, like many valve gears, that it opens to admit steam to the cylinder just before the start of a piston stroke. The pressure of that steam provides the driving force for the stroke. Then, before the space on one side of the piston starts to contract, the valve starts to release steam from that space and vent it out so as not to impede the movement of the piston. It's pretty simple in that regard, and that was part of the appeal. It didn't overcomplicate things, it just worked. And it did offer those two settings. Under the economy setting, the steam is admitted to the expanding space for only part of the stroke, not the whole thing. And the intake cutoff point could actually be set by the engineer. The result of this is that the remainder of the stroke is being driven by steam expansion, not steam admission. You could get most of the energy out of the steam that would otherwise be wasted. For this to work, the economy setting does require that the throttle be all the way open, and that the boiler pressure is at the maximum safe level. And at full running, on the open line, most engines probably would have been operating on that setting. There was no reason to not use it, but sometimes you needed all that untapped POWER! And thus you use the power setting. And that, uh, that was different. That was, that was a bit different. Engineers would utilize that setting when they were either trying to pull out of a station, getting a train started, or when they're going up a grade. Under that setting, the cutoff point is set near the end of the stroke, and the result of this is that the full pressure of the whole boiler is exerted on the piston, which results in a, in a lot of force, like a lot of force. But it does waste that steam expansion. It doesn't utilize all the energy, it just utilizes the maximum pressure of the boiler. So, you do waste quite a lot of steam if you use that setting all the time, which is why they absolutely didn't do that, only when they had to. But the thing about the power setting is that it's probably the most familiar to people in terms of sound. The chug, 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 chug noise you might be familiar with, the classic steam engine sound, that's the power setting of a Walsharts. This is because it was usually being used when trains were starting at, say, a station. Where people would be getting onto them. So people were very familiar with that sound. The economy setting doesn't actually sound like that. If the crew knows what they're doing, the economy setting sounds more like a soft hissing noise that goes throughout the entire stroke of the gear. Either way though, Walsharts design went down in history, without question because it was just so good. It did what it needed to do, and did it well. It was able to expand it upon and improved, applied to so many different designs, 
And again, your favorite steam locomotive probably had a wall shark. It probably did. You might have one of the exceptions, but for the most part, they always had a wall shark because it was the one that functioned. There were certainly other additions, other valve gears that existed, other ideas out there, but wall shark was by far the most famous, the classic example, and the most prevalent staying in the industry right up until the end of steam very much a case of if it ain't broke don't fix it it's fine you can increase the boiler pressure you can mess with the drivers you can do anything else don't you dare touch that valve gear it's fine leave it alone it just works precision belgian engineering people till next time this is darkness and i bid you all a fun farewell